good good afternoon I, or evening, depending on where you're joining from. Uh, my name is Courtney Doggart. I'm the president of Network 2020. We're a New York-based organization, a nonprofit organization that really focuses on bridging the gap between the private sector and the foreign policy world. Um, and we do this through a lot of education, research, um, and you're joining today as part of our virtual briefing series, which we started uh, during the pandemic, which is free and open to all around the world. So we're very happy to have you join us today. Um, we are very lucky, especially in the run up to the US elections that are right around the corner to have both Nina Jankowitz and Yael Eisenstadt join us today to talk about disinformation. Um, Yael is uh, currently a visiting fellow at Cornell Tech's Digital Life Initiative, but she has a really phenomenal career that spans um, private sector, public sector, um, you know, between work at ExxonMobil, she's worked at, uh, at the CIA, she's written extensively on uh, disinformation, on security. So she is really an, uh, quite an authoritative figure on the topic um, and comes at it from many different angles. And we are also delighted to have Nina Jankowitz with us who literally wrote a book on this topic, um, you know, really focusing on Russia and fake news and the future of conflict. Um, and again, like Yael, she is widely published, New York Times, Washington Post, The Atlantic. Um, and so we're really quite fortunate to have both of them here with us today for a really quite a very important topic um, to, to discuss. So with that, um, what I'd like to do now is just um, kick it off um, and I'll turn to you first, Nina. But if you could just talk about who some of the main players are that are impacting disinformation in the upcoming election and what are some other political factors that are coming into play? Sure. So I think one of the most important things to know that I hopefully this, you know, kind of myth is being dispelled since 2016, but we used the term fake news a lot to describe what is going on in our information ecosystems in information and influence operations. And it couldn't be more wrong. What disinformation does is, is play on our emotions, right? These real grievances in society. That's why we've seen so much disinformation around the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and that's important to know when we talk about who the main actors are as we're going into 2020. Um, of course, we still have foreign interference happening according to the intelligence community uh, and things that have been released ahead of the election in order to arm the American people with knowledge about you know, the true nature of the threat. Uh, not only Russia, but China, Iran, um, are also involved in these influence operations. And we've seen some uh, things coming out, not necessarily election related, but um, coming out of places like Venezuela, Brazil, North Korea as well. So um, it's important to look at, at that picture holistically and understand that there's not just one threat actor. In fact, there has always never been just one threat actor, although Russia does appear to be the most sophisticated. Um, now, all of that being said, I think the disinformation de environment domestically is really uh, what is worrying me ahead of our November 3rd vote and the voting that's already happening today. Um, we have, you know, officials from the White House, including the president himself, spreading malign narratives about the safety of things like voting by mail, which is, you know, uh, necessary during the pandemic, number one. And, and number two, uh, there's no evidence to the contrary that voting by mail is not safe and secure. So uh, our adversaries are picking up on that messaging. They don't have to do that much in terms of creating content. All they have to do is amplify what's already coming from within the United States. And that was always the case to some extent, we are making their job much, much easier and leaving ourselves more vulnerable to manipulation uh, when our own politicians are not embracing the you know, tenets of truth, basically. Before I turn to Yael, I just wanted to ask a follow up question. Um, you'd, you'd mentioned, you know, obviously, we're, when we hear disinformation, a lot of times in the US, we're, we're only thinking about Russia. And like you said, you know, there's Iran, there's China, Venezuela. Um, could you dig a little bit deeper into um, what some of what some of those other actors are doing and how this compares to what one has seen historically. I mean, obviously there's a lot more opportunity now with, with the internet and the social media, but, um, but it, it would just be interesting to put that in context. 
Yeah, absolutely. So now I'm going to do, do another term uh, soapbox moment because this is a, another, you know, uh, misconception that I love to dispel. A lot of people will use the terms dis and misinformation and propaganda kind of interchangeably. They're not the same thing. So what the Soviet Union did uh, is propaganda. That is, you know, this informational operation that is pushing a specific worldview or ideology. That's very similar to what China is doing today, um, especially during the coronavirus pandemic. The idea is to cast a positive light on China and the CCP, China's coronavirus response, what Russia does is, is very different. Um, and that is to pit Americans against one, each, one another, basically. And this happens in, in other countries around the world as well. It's not necessarily propaganda because it doesn't have that same ideological motive. In fact, we've seen in the United States and elsewhere, Russia agitating on both sides of the political spectrum. Again, in order to increase discord and dismay and get people to disengage either with the information environment, uh, you know, democracy really doesn't work without uh, trustworthy information that people can consume, um, but also get people to engage with the democratic process writ large, either seeding narratives that make them distrust the system or seeding narratives that make them say, you know what, my vote doesn't matter, I'm not going to turn out to vote. Um, and so that's where the, the kind of uh, tactics and, and goals diverge a little bit. Um, Ch China and Russia are the two more sophisticated actors. Uh, but again, most of what we've seen in the overt sphere coming from China is um, pretty clear that it is agitating on, on behalf of, of one ideological faction, whereas Russia is better at obscuring um, where that's coming from. Okay, great, thank you. And then Yael, turning to you, similar question about um, just about what, what are some of the main players impacting disinformation and what are the political factors coming into play? And I think you have a really interesting experience just both you know, working on national security, but then you know, really digging deep into you know, domestic on the domestic side more recently. Sure. Um, thanks again for hosting this. I, I always enjoy these more thoughtful conversations around this topic. There's, there's no way to address this entire topic in two minutes, like so many people want everyone to do. Um, Nina laid out really well who the players are um, right now, so I won't go too far into, into who the different international players are. Um, but to pick up on a really important point Nina made as well is, you know, a lot of what we talk about, I, I like to say we're, we're still talking about the threat of 2016 and the threat of 2020 is not the same landscape. Yes, we are still seeing Russia trying to engage in, in ways to sow discord. And yes, now there's, you know, China is becoming a player in some of this, but so much of the threat is now actually much more domestically driven and it's driven by different um, networks in the US who are, whether it's, the funny thing is we all assume it's all politically ideologically motivated, right? And it's not, some of it is actually financially motivated. Some of it is just trying to take, take advantage of chaos to, to build some sort of online brand to monetize it. Like there's so many different things that affect this. But for the purpose of what we're talking about, for the purpose of this election, um, my concerns lay in various different buckets. Of course, you have the foreign interference angle. And that is the angle that without a question, our government, our media, our social media platform should all be on the same page working to counter it. Um, a little bit hard, you know, I try, I'll, I'll just put in a little personal moment here. I try very, very hard to always, I, I served under three different administrations. I try as hard as I can to make my comments be as nonpartisan as possible, but almost to my own detriment of not calling out what we are seeing. And we are seeing a US president who is doing everything he can to be the number one sower of misinformation and disinformation about our election, about the process, about the outcome. So it would be ridiculous of me to not point out that that's actually where so much of this is coming from. Um, but then you also have these domestic networks. And the biggest issue is not necessarily any one piece of information, whether it's true, whether it's false, whether it's misleading. It's the fact that they have completely broken down our trust. And that is what is going to overwhelmingly harm our democracy because we don't know what to trust anymore. We don't know which news outlet to trust. We don't know what to trust when we see things on social media. And that is the plan. 
Um, you know, maybe Nina knows more about this than I do, but I always like to talk about, you know, in the 80s, there was this KGB defector who specifically did this whole like video, uh, his last name was Bezmanov, I uh, probably didn't pronounce it very well, but he specifically spoke about this like very long term plan on how to demoralize America. And in that video, I recommend people go look at it. He specifically talks about how it's going to take a few generations, but you're, they're going to break down our trust and make it so that we don't even know what's fact or fiction anymore. Am I saying that the Soviet Union achieved that and it's all Russia? No, but it's really interesting to think about rather than identifying every single individual who's sowing misinformation and disinformation, it's the fact that we don't trust anything anymore. And that is so incredibly dangerous to our democracy. And I'm sure we will get into who I, who I blame and what I think people can, what different companies can do to help solve that. Yes, well, we, we are actually about to get there, but, but I think it's a, it's, it's a really excellent point about the, the foundations of trust. And already, you know, pre-2016, you know, some of the big talks were about just the breakdown in trust and expertise, for example. And so it's, I think that that's just, just getting worse over time. Um, so, but just to pick up on your last point, you know, looking both within the US and internationally, what steps have been taken to combat this problem and what more do you think can be done? So I'll start with you, Yael, and then turn to you, Nina. Sure, I'll, I'll focus a little bit more on the social media angle. Um, I mean, Nina and I could both talk about the national security angle. I can talk about the intel angle, um, but I'll start with the social media angle because I did work at Facebook for a little while trying to tackle some of these things. Um, I think first and foremost, the most important thing to say is this is, there, I, there is no one solution to any of it. It's not all Facebook's fault. It's not all CNN's fault. It's not all Fox News's fault. It is an entire ecosystem of players who are contributing to what's happening right now. But on the social media front, since that is a lot of what I focus on, um, you know, Facebook's had four years. I'm going to focus on Facebook for two reasons. One, because I worked there. And two, they are the dominant, m biggest player in how we receive information, how we view information, how information flows. Um, they had four years since the 2016 election to really figure out what, what role are they going to play moving forward in elections globally at scale. But at the end of the day, they also are headquartered here in the US and if they can't get it right here, where are they gonna get it right? Um, you know, we seeing all these emergency approaches now as if Facebook didn't realize this election was coming for the last four years. For the last four years, they have allowed players, especially President Trump, to flaunt all of their rules to, to they, they Okay, I'm going to be careful here. It's going to, I'm going to give a 40 minute rant. So I'm going to try to rein it in, but specifically regarding this election, they, there's two different sides. There's the organic side and there's the political advertising side. Um, personally, I think the organic side, which is just posts, it's not paid for post is the bigger concern, but let me start with the political advertising side really quickly because there's so much media attention on it. Facebook, Finally, you know, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal came out and after the scandal about what the Russians did on the Facebook platform, they did put in all sorts of tools. This is what I was hired to help with, um, all sorts of tools to verify who's advertising, to try to make sure that Russians and other actors, they were very focused on Russia, but any global actors couldn't buy political ads for U.S. elections, things like that. Um, what they didn't do and what I still to this day will say is their most dangerous step is they refuse to fact check political ads coming from politicians. And you can't lump that into the idea of freedom of speech because this is paid advertising. So not only are you receiving money for it, but you're also providing these sophisticated targeting tools to target people with it. And what does that mean? That means Nina and I might live across, we don't, but we might live across the street from each other and we might see two totally different versions of ads from the same political player. So Nina and I cannot then come meet in the cul-de-sac and have a political discussion because we're coming from two different sets of facts. And this is enabled by the tools that Facebook is providing to political players to target us with different political messages. That is the thing they will not change. And that is the thing that I will continue to advocate for. 
It's the way you can be micro-targeted with political ads and the fact that they will let politicians lie. Um, I, I, I don't want to overly dominate the question. You can come back to me and I'll give all my thoughts on what's wrong on the organic side as well. But that's just sort of where it, it's really concerning. We're heading into an election where we have, in addition to international players, we have our own president who continues to say that mail-in ballots will be fraudulent, that Democrats are going to steal the election, that, you know, constant messaging to sow distrust in the actual process. Imagine what's going to happen after November 3rd, which I'm sure we'll get into later in this conversation. And Facebook just, all of their whack-a-mole approaches now, we'll take this down, we'll leave this up. The reason they're in the situation where it's constant whack-a-mole is because they never addressed the core issues of how their platform is operationalized to begin with. Um, I can get into more of that if you want later in the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it would be interesting. I don't know if you want to delve into it now, but 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 I mean, it's interesting. I think they just came out with an announcement yesterday about um, about not airing any political ads. I think until the after November third. But um, but where do you think this resistance is coming from? So. <laughs> Again, I, I'll, I'll just be blunt. I, I am tired of trying to be really politically nuanced about some of these things because I have looked at it from every angle possible. And at the end of the day, the one company, I mean, Twitter makes a lot of mistakes, but I think they're trying to be more thoughtful and figuring out what their role should be. Even if it's not perfect, they do listen to some of their critics and they do try to make changes. And even YouTube has tried to make some changes. Facebook is the one company where the CEO himself has doubled down and the only thing I can see is that he doesn't want to anger the party in power that has the tools to not just regulate them, but to actually take around away the privileges they're receiving. And without getting into what this whole Section 230 debate is, it is a privilege and it is a basically a gift to Facebook to say that they won't ever be held accountable for any of this. And so they have allowed President Trump to flaunt their policies. They have continuously not enforced their existing policies evenly. When they do this both sideism thing, we'll just label everything. That's actually not only making it even harder to know what to trust, but it's very clear it's because they don't want to ever be in a position to have to fact check Donald Trump. So the only thing I can look at it is it's it's they don't want to be on the wrong side of this administration and to in my opinion that's a choice that could come back to bite them in the long run. All right, thank you. Um, and then just shifting gears a little, Nina, is there anything that that you've seen you know, particularly in, in the international realm in terms of response that has worked or hasn't worked or that other places are trying? I think you're muted. <laughs> I'm muted. Um, <laughs> it's seven months in, still haven't figured that one out. Uh, so I, I think in terms of the countries that have had more holistic responses, they are the ones that are dealing with this problem uh, a little bit more successfully um, because of all the reasons that Yael just uh, laid out. You know, we're never going to get there fully until we have some compliance and uh, and response from the social media platforms that's um, more aggressive isn't the right word, but um, efficient, that recognizes the problem for what it is, that puts you know the health of democracy ahead of their own uh, business and, and economic well-being. I think those are three important things they need to figure out. But um, those countries that are you know building resilience in addition to trying to play whack a troll, they are uh, you know investing in things like media and, and digital literacy, um, IT security awareness, basic just cyber hygiene. Um, the public media, for instance, is a, is a huge issue. Um, you know, where there is a local news vacuum or even a news vacuum entirely, that's somewhere that disinformation can really thrive. Um, and we have a lot of those in the United States, frankly, and that's why we're seeing a lot of these fake local news sites popping up, both used by our foreign adversaries and hyper-partisan outlets here uh, in the States. So um, we, we do need to look inward when we're thinking about how to counter disinformation. There, there are responses on the platform side. There are responses in terms of making consequences for bad actors who engage in this stuff. And I'm not only talking about things like sanctions on Russia, we also need to think about how to disincentivize the use of disinformation in our domestic environment, particularly by politicians during campaign seasons. But 
all of these things, whether they're coming from Russia or China or someone within the United States are playing on those fissures in our society. And so one of the things that we do is we need to do is try to mend them. Uh, media literacy can only go so far when you have endemic racism in your country or you know widespread economic inequality. Um, you can't legislate good governance and we can't fa fact check our way out of this crisis as much as I think we'd like to. Um, but all of these things are interconnected. Uh, it's not just you know um, a symbiosis of, of the platforms and the fact that we have these uh, you know hyperpartisan outlets, hyperpartisan uh, messages coming from abroad. Um, it's also the fact that we we have problems that are exploitable. And so countries like Estonia have recognized that uh, Ukraine is sort of getting there, but they also have some tendencies in their regulatory space that are fairly anti-democratic. Um, and you know they're trying to crack down on disinformation, but that also means that speech is getting quashed in the country, which is something that we are going to struggle with. We have struggled with a lot here. Uh, but I do think that there is a balance in terms of a holistic approach to this. And so, um, you know, when the national security community is talking about this stuff, it's important that there's not just folks from the Department of Defense, the DHS, and the State Department in the room. We need the Department of Education in the room. We need perhaps the National Endowment for Humanities and the Arts in the room, because those are people who are having effects on Americans' daily lives. And we need to think about how to reach them with this sort of activity. Can I, can I just add a point to that? Mm -hmm. um, because I love everything Nina just said. I, I, you know, after 2016, the question I kept asking, which is part of what led me to start speaking publicly, which is part of what led Facebook to call me to begin with, is I kept asking, you know, I don't, I think it's important to do a postmortem and understand what Russia did. But to me, the bigger question wasn't, did Russia sway our election in one way or the other, or did they intervene? To me, the biggest question that I kept putting out there was, why were we as a society so susceptible to what they were trying to do? This is not the only country in the world where Russia has tried to infuse their messaging and sort of this disruptive thing they were doing, but somehow it really worked here. And why? Because we are, we have all of these societal issues that we need to fix. So this is why there's no one solution in and of itself, you can't just say fix Facebook, or you can't just say get rid of Fox News, or you can't just say get rid of MSM. You can't. Say, none of that's in its own a solution. And so I love the way Nina framed that because I keep asking people, but do we want to even understand why these tactics worked, or do we want to just keep trying to counter the tactic itself? So then, if if that's the case, and just to um... You know, push back a little here. I mean, what, what I'm hearing you say is like, is that we we were very, we in the United States were very ripe for this kind of disinformation campaign. And to fix it, one really needs to take a holistic approach that's looking at some of the ailments in society. But that also seems like a really big job. And so, and so short of getting it entirely right with a holistic approach you know is, is are there are there some things that that we can do in the short term and particularly in a polarized political climate i mean it seems like that would be very hard to do you coming to me with this one uh, I'm, I'm i'm coming at both of you, you, you so. <laughs> so that's why i put the things i i keep screaming about into two different buckets there's the bigger systemic issues that if we ever want to get to a place, like there's the first principles, what is the society we want to be? If we want to have a healthier information ecosystem, if we want to have a more just and prosperous world, like there's, there's the bigger, who do we want to be and how do we get there? And then there's the emergency moments ahead of this election. So those are sort of two different buckets. Emergency ahead of this election, I'm focusing on the exact things I think Facebook needs to do right now, right? That doesn't fix all any of the larger things. So they're definitely two different buckets but there are definitely things that need to happen right now as well i don't think that we're going to succeed in an incredible media literacy campaign between now and november 3rd but we still need to focus on trying to educate people as much as possible on what's happening while insisting again that companies like facebook really really prioritize the public and democracy over their profit right now like they need to I will say it again, as long as they continue to decide they will not fact check the president, I will never agree with that decision, but they are going to have to decide, are they going to continue to let posts spreading blatant misinformation about how to vote, about the reliability of mail-in ballots, all of these things. And, and let's take it a step much more dangerous. 
Are they going to let any social media platform, are they going to let the president's son put out posts calling militias to join them to defend the election? Nina just wrote a piece about this. Like, are they, th these are really dangerous things. And unfortunately, Facebook has been on the wrong side of this again and again and again. From the letting the post uh, looters, shooters post up months ago and not decide to take action against that, to allowing people, I think Twitter did as well, Nina, correct me if I'm wrong, um, like Don Jr. specifically call out to like militias to take up arms and go to the polls. These are things that they are on the wrong side of history for allowing this to happen. And they have the power to not let this happen. They're choosing not to exercise that power. Yeah, I think I think Yael is exactly right in terms of the short term necessities. Um, that being said, you know, <laughs> For too long, for the last four years, we've been focused on putting out tiny little fires as they come up and, and playing whack a troll. And we need to look at the more holistic stuff because now we've squandered that four years by saying, oh, we can do media literacy at any time. Um, this stuff takes time to get through Congress and the legislative process, time to develop curriculums, time to, to reach people and actually do the work. Um, and, and we're squandering that time as we as we sit here debating, well, maybe we just need one more study, seeing if media literacy is, is, is going to work. I don't care if, if people forget it, you know, uh, a year after the training that they went through. For that year, they're going to be a better democratic citizen and they're going to be able to evaluate uh, information more critically. It's it's really important. But then outside of all of that, and this isn't something we can do before November, um, but my research finds, and this is not shocking, it shouldn't be shocking to anybody, that um, in a country where you, perhaps you recognize the threat of foreign interference, but you draw the line between foreign and domestic and you say, you know, no, here in, in our country, uh, we can we can use political messaging. It's not the same as the stuff that the Russians are doing. We can use bot and troll networks uh, to, to kind of manipulate the com conversation. That's fine, just as long as it's not coming from our adversary. That's where the counter disinformation stuff does not work. Um, none of these policies are robust, and that's the situation that we find ourselves in today. Uh, the Republic of Georgia has had something similar to happen to them, despite having 20% of their uh, territory annexed by Russia. Uh, Poland, which has no love lost with the Kremlin, hasn't for centuries, also finds itself in a similar situation with the Law and Justice Party, which has used many of these tactics in the Polish media ecosystem. Uh, and we're, we're dealing with the same thing with an added layer of no foreign interference is a hoax. So a lot of Americans don't even believe that it's a thing. And it is, despite what our intelligence agencies are putting out, people are not buying uh, these actually very good public service announcements that DHS and FBI have been putting out over the past couple of weeks. Uh, they think they're part of the deep state and they believe what the president tweets about the Russia investigation, et cetera, et cetera. And on top of all of that, uh, we just have this rampant use of disinformation information in our own political environment. Um, and until we have that recognition from the very top of government that this is a priority, that this is a threat to our national security and the very foundations of our democracy, we can't, we can't really make progress on it unless we have that sea change. If we had a president who weren't using uh, you know, the social media debate as, as a political football, as President Trump has been doing, um, you know, with allegations of anti-conservative bias happening on the platform, uh, I think we'd have a very different response from the social media companies. Yes, they would still be tepid. Uh, they would resist regulation. They would resist responding. But if we had somebody that was actually, uh, you know, advocating for democratic rights, not only here in the United States, but everywhere where the laws of our land will have ripple effects, where platforms like Facebook and WhatsApp are the way that people get uh, information, um, I think things would look very different. So that, that stuff needs to come from the top, which is, you know, the only way we can make that happen is at the ballot box. Disinformation on top of disinformation. Uh, so, okay, uh, before we turn to the Q&A box, and if at any point anyone listening wants to put a question in the Q&A box, please do. I'd love to just, you know, give a really quick question to both of you as to, you know, as we get closer to November 3rd, you know, what, what types of disinformation campaigns do you think that we'll see um, or even after November 3rd? You know, do you anticipate different kinds of disinformation campaigns? Um, yeah, I'll, why don't you go first and then Nina will, will follow up. Sure. Um, I want to add another layer on top of 
everything Nina just said. I don't know if you saw me cheering you along as you were talking there. Um, and on top of that, I haven't actually gotten to the number one thing that I actually focus on, which is policy changes and legislation and regulation. And part of what's very complicated is that where in the US, you know, we have this strong, not just tradition, it's core and fundamental to who we are, these tenets of free speech. But as a result, we're also mudding the conversation about legislation because people keep talking, saying that it's the government trying to regulate speech, which is not actually, I mean, there might be some who are trying to do that. That's not what I'm advocating. But I will lay some of this blame at our, at our government's feet as well, because even the most basic rules, even the most basic rules, not the ones that would change the entire landscape of what we're talking about, even the most basic rules are not applying online. The most basic rules about how political advertising can be paid for, the transparency around it that applies in, in newspaper and television does not apply online. And, and, you know, we've had this Honest Ads Act, for example, sitting there forever in the Senate, not being passed. Is it perfect? Does it solve the vast majority of what Nina and I are talking about? No. But the fact that even that basic law can't be passed, at the end of the day, it has to, like, our government has got to catch up and say, we have a problem in our information ecosystem, and we have to figure out how to update our laws to address them. I won't get into all of my ideas about what all those laws should be. I just wanna throw that out there. Now, November 3rd onwards, I'm gonna focus on November 3rd onwards. I hate to say, I feel like it's already a lost case between now and November 3rd. People have already started voting. I, I, unless there is the most outrageous hack and dump or hack and leak operation or something that really changes the landscape, I, I don't know what more we can do between now and November 3rd. But I'll just really quickly say this, here's the nightmare scenario for me after November 3rd in terms of disinformation. You have a situation where different parties may actually have different amounts of turnout in terms of mail-in voting versus voting in person. So what looks like the results on November 3rd may not actually be the realistic results once more mail-in ballots are starting to be counted. But if you are going to give Donald Trump free reign and his surrogates to say whatever they want on social media, they will claim victory on November 3rd. And then they will start all of this thing that's been happening before November 3rd, dog whistling to people to go monitor the polls and sowing all of this distrust. There's a purpose in that. It's like right out of a dictator's playbook, right? It's so that when November 3rd happens, they can say, see, I told you, we won. You saw that we won. And as they're counting all these fraudulent ballots, look, they're starting to steal the election. So that's one issue is if, and that is incumbent not just on social media, but on how the media decides to report on election results. If they allow that to happen, I don't see how we're going to come out of that without some potential real violence in the streets. And secondly, the one thing that does really scare me as well is we haven't even talked about synthetic media. I can envision not even sophisticated fake videos. It doesn't cost that much to pay an actor to put on a postal worker suit and go dump a bunch of pieces of paper in the river to claim, look, we caught this post office worker dumping ballots. I told you it would be fraudulent. It's in a Republican county. Republicans' votes weren't counted. And that will spread like wildfire on the internet before it's even addressed or fact-checked because there's no friction. Things can go viral in the two minutes before anybody even notices and starts to have their debate about whether or not to take it down. These things are incredibly concerning. And again, because our government didn't step up in time, we are at the will of people like Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg to decide how they're gonna handle that. Sorry, I don't mean to terrify everyone, but I'm terrified, so. <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything uh, Yael said. I mean, no surprise here. <laughs> I feel like we could take the show on the road. Um, but one thing that I would add, um, and you know, I think anybody is probably, we're all probably thinking about this right now, uh, based on what happened in 2016, is the possibility of another hack and leak operation. Um, the campaigns have gotten better about their cybersecurity. I hope that private companies who are consulting with the campaigns have as well, but we did get 
uh, about a month ago, I want to say now, um, from Microsoft, a release about how many campaigns and campaign adjacent properties had been targeted. They said none of them were successful, but these are some of the best hackers in the world from, from Russia and China attempting to, to you know, find the weak link. And often we know it's not necessarily about cybersecurity procedures, it's about human engineering. Um, and you know, social engineering, getting people to click on phishing links, developing phishing emails that are really uh, convincing, you know, tech support calls um, that get you to give up your credentials, things like this. Um, and all you need is, is one person to slip up for one second when they're tired in the lead up to this crazy election. Uh, and then we can have a situation where a lot of these sensitive documents are dumped after the election, throwing more doubt and chaos onto the entire process. Um, and once the vote has happened, I mean, that would be a, a, a true nightmare scenario. So that's something I'm, um, I'm pretty worried about. And then to pick up the thread about poll watchers that we've been seeing recently, um, the, the thing that's worrisome to me about this, obviously the militarization of the idea of election observation and poll watching is very disturbing to me as someone who has observed elections in multiple countries and used to support election observers. Um, what is even more concerning is the fact that the platforms cannot see that these, even though, you know, tr the Trump campaign will claim we're training our people, you know, they're going to abide by all of the rules. The very fact that this is remaining on platforms is a threat. It is voter intimidation. If you are a black or brown person and you see a call for Trump supporters to uh, join the Trump army and that they're going to dispatch to your swing district that you live in, are you going to take your kids to the polls with you when you go to vote? Are you going to go to vote at all? Are you going to change your voting plan um, because you are afraid of the violence that you might encounter? You might. And we need to think about that just because something is not a direct threat, but is a dog whistle like these ads have been like Trump's language about go and watch at, at the debate, which he said, and stand by to the Proud Boys. Those are the sorts of things that actually have offline effects. They're hard to measure, but we need, we need something to pull that back, especially when we're talking about the actual democratic process and counting of ballots itself. Um, so that again is that horse has left the barn. I agree with Yael, unfortunately. Thank you for that point. I mean, but all, all of those points I think are, are really, really important. And Nina, what, what you just said too, I mean, is, is uh, Network 2020 being a foreign affairs focused organization, it's, 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 it's interesting to me to be in this position where for so long stories that you hear about that affect other countries in terms of voter intimidation, or, you know, do you feel secure going to the polls or not uh, to suddenly have that come home to roost? I think it's, it's a very, um, it's just a very interesting paradigm shift. So um, with that, we're going to turn to the Q&A box. So our first question is from Krishan Mehta, and it's for you, Nina. Um, and so he writes, as per the letter by, by John Radcliffe, Director of Nat uh, National Intelligence to the US Senate on September 29th, 2020, it is the conclusion of the US intelligence now that the disinformation campaign connecting President Putin and the Russians to President Trump and his campaign was launched by Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign in late July, 2016, as a means of distracting the public from her use of a private mail server. So I know that that's a lot for everyone to digest this long sentence, but if that letter is correct, then why is your assertion of disinformation by Russia and other parties more accurate than that of the US Director of National Intelligence? <sighs> um, okay, first of all, this assessment uh, that was just made public now was made public based on something that we don't even know is true. It was a Russian intelligence assessment that uh, was the president was briefed on in 2016. Uh, we have no means of knowing whether or not that Russian intelligence assessment is actually based in fact, or whether it was planted as a means of disinformation to influence policy in 2016. The fact that we are still litigating the 2016 election uh, here in 2020, even though Hillary Clinton is not no longer a candidate for president, uh, is disappointing that this intelligence would be politicized that way, uh, released at a strategic moment to detract from everything else that is going on in the country and, and worrying people. Number one, we cannot politicize this issue of disinformation, as I already talked about before. And the fact that the DNI has done that uh, is extremely worrisome. Um, how do I know that Russian, Russian disinformation is real? Because I've lived it. 
Uh, I worked for, you know, the as an advisor to the uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a strategic communications advisor. Um, what Ukraine is dealing with, has been dealing with since 2013, was only a precursor to what we're dealing with here in the United States. And there's plenty of open source evidence connecting Russia to all of these online disinformation campaigns, connecting Russia to the hacking of the DNC email servers and the Clinton campaign. Uh, that is something you know that <laughs> we, we should not lose sight of, that it's not just one person who is saying all of this stuff. It has been independently confirmed by many, many uh, experts outside of the government. Um, and the fact that this information is only coming out now, again, I think is part and par parcel of the politicization of this issue. And I'm sure that Yael has something to add here. <laughs> you can see my head exploding right now, can't you? Um, I, I, I won't add a lot. I'll just, because Nina got it spot on. I, I mean, I'll just remember, remind people as I did start my career as a CIA officer. And in at some point, I was actually the person in charge of the PDB for for NCTC. And so I will remind you that when the intelligence community put out a memo, I don't even, at this point, I don't even remember how long ago this was about this. And it had, it agreed, the FBI agreed, the CIA agreed, the DNI agreed to get, and they all agreed with high confidence. You have to understand that is not, that, that means that every major part of the intelligence agencies, every made, and these are the career intelligence officers came to the same conclusion. That is very different when you have a very politically motivated person who unfortunately is claiming to be speaking on behalf of the intelligence community. And so it's, it's, to Nina's point, I'm not going to relitigate 2016. I feel like our intelligence community did their job in litigating that. I feel like the Mueller investigation did its job. And there are plenty of very reputable academics and public organizations who have also done their job on that. But this is why it is so terrifying when you have an administration that is politicizing intelligence. When I first wrote my first piece admitting to my CIA background. I did it the day after he was went to go visit the CIA after inauguration. I put a line in there that this is the first step in a dictator's playbook. And I was trying to warn that politicizing the intelligence community, whatever you think about the intelligence community, is dangerous. And what we're seeing now is the perfect example of why. And, and, and just for those who, who are listening, who might not be as familiar with the government or the American government, um, you know, what you said about, about career officers, um, I think it, it's a real point of pride for people that are career officers in the government um, that they serve any administration. Their oath is to the constitution. It's not to an administration. And that's a really important point. Um, so with that, um, turning to a question from Nadim Shahadi, who um, he's uh, he writes, Russian disinformation or disinformatia existed long before social media and with comparable effect. The aim is to confuse and sow doubt in the system. Aren't narratives of Russian interference sowing doubt in the election results and thus falling into that trap? So it's sort of like, are, are, we, are we doing this by, by talking about it in, in many ways? And, and, and the difference, again, between propaganda and disinformatia, but disinformatia being you know, the goal of creating that confusion. Yeah, so the difference between the Soviet disinformatia and what we're seeing today is the fact of exactly what Yael explained very um, cogently before. Social media empowers bad actors, whether foreign or domestic, to be able to take and test a narrative, to find which narrative is the most effective, and then target that narrative over and over and over and over to the population that will find it most Effect, most um, interesting, most they're, they're most vulnerable to it, right? Uh, and that's what's so scary about it. It used to take a long time for that information to travel or longer. You know, it had to be on a newscast. It had to be on the radio. It had to be in a print zine that would get uh, distributed among, um, you know, fringe, uh, fringe individuals. Now that can be targeted to people that would have never received that information before. And that's what's so scary. Um, yes. Uh, however, I do think that there is a uh, there is a, a risk of overplaying the threat of Russia. And that's why I've been saying, and I think Yael has as, as well, that, you know, the disinformation we're seeing, the most worrisome disinformation that we're seeing in this cycle is coming from inside the house. Um, that being said, that doesn't make what Russia or China or Iran is doing okay. 
um, we should not stand for foreign entities masquerading as Americans on the internet in order to change our democratic discourse and our uh, democratic outcomes. That's not okay. Um, but it does give Putin a, a certain sense of gravitas, right? One of his goals is to return uh, Russia to great power status. He believes that the fall of the Soviet Union was one of the greatest geopolitical disasters in the 20th century. So when we are constantly talking about Russia and the Russian threat, uh, that's good for him. That's good for him at home. It makes him look very strong. And also it means that, you know, he's invited to the global negotiating table more often than not. Um, we have Trump and Macron even uh, floating the idea of inviting Putin back to the G7, even though he was kicked out of the G7 for illegally annexing Crimea and hasn't returned Crimea to Ukraine yet. We're still considering that. So I think that shows how effective his kind of bullying asymmetric warfare policy actually is. And we do need to be careful um, the media in particular has blown out of proportion a couple of reports and websites that certain entities are connected to the IRA when they're actually not having a lot of impact. I think it's more compelling and more effective to, to report on the tactics and how they affect individual lives. And that's one thing I try to do in, in my work to, to really go into operations and say, how did this work? Who did it affect uh, here on the ground in, in the United States. And there are plenty of examples of that. And that, that I think is more compelling to the average American than, ooh, scary Russia Kremlin said, of course, in, in a like funny Soviet accent. Okay, go on. Sorry, I was just gonna add a small point to that. Um, so yeah, do, do, did Russian disinformation and information warfare exist long before Facebook did? Of course it did. Um, I don't blame Mark Zuckerberg for Putin's intentions. What I do blame him for though, is knowing what we know now, continuing to provide the tools that he is providing to make what could be an information warfare or disinformation campaign that as Nina pointed out, would have taken a lot longer and not been quite as pervasive before, just give him the tools to put it on steroids. I mean, at the end of the day, <laughs> When, when Zuckerberg likes to say, we could never have seen this coming, I always joke. I'm like, oh, I'll bet you a bunch of the CIA officers who worked in the Cold War could have seen it coming had they understood how Facebook's tools work. The, the idea that the Russians would wanna do this shouldn't surprise anybody. Um, it's, it's that we, do you know how much cheaper it is to sow this kind of chaos via Facebook than it is to use tanks, drones, and planes? Like this is, but to Nina's point, it's also very convenient for Facebook to brag about every time they take down a Russian network because they don't actually wanna talk about the domestic networks. And so it's a very difficult thing. I always try very hard to balance. This is still a problem, but don't let it detract as being the biggest problem or the only problem. But it is difficult to do that. It is difficult to strike that balance um, because it's still a geopolitical issue that we have to consider as a country as well. There's no easy answer to that. I did really like Nina's point. I hadn't thought about this before, so I appreciate it. The idea of how much that serves Putin though, every time we talk about it, it's it's a really fair point as well. Okay, great. Um, let's see, I'm trying to decide which question to go with next. Um, why don't we, we, we can stay on Russia just for a little bit. And then there's, there, there's two more questions that I wanna combine into one that I wanna get to, but because I know we have a hard stop at one. So we have one from Chris Abbott, we'll stay on Russia for a minute. And so he wants to know, what is the incentive for Putin to choose one American candidate over another? And how would you assess the relative benefit of a Trump re-election versus a Biden election to Russia? Uh, I think the Biden administration will be much harder on Russia if they're elected. Um, I think Biden has a clear record on Russia. He's stood up against Russian aggression in places like Ukraine throughout his entire career. He's been a huge uh, uh, supporter of NATO and NATO enlargement to post-communist former satellite states. Um, and I think Putin knows that. With Trump, um, there's a lot of levers of influence um, that I'm sure Yael can also talk about, but clearly a man who is in debt uh, a man who has cozied up to dictators before and continues to do so, a man who goes against the, the conclusions of his own intelligence community uh, in order to prop up said dictators. Um, you know, I think that is a, clearly a, a, a much more malleable target for, for Putin. And the Trump administration folks will tell you, and on paper it looks pretty good, 
that you know they've sanctioned X number of Russian officials, that their policies on, on Ukraine have only been strengthened. Yes, that's true. That's in, in large part due to the work of civil servants and diplomats who have continued uh, to, to carry the moral call calling card of the United States and what we stand up for. Um, but that Russia policy has been incongruent in the Trump administration. We see all those actions happening uh, throughout you know, departments. And then we see President Trump joking with Putin about fake news, about not meddling in the election and things like that. Um, and that means you know, we can sanction Russia. We can sanction them all we want to Timbuktu and back. But that's not going to deter Putin from thinking about whether he's going to stop his intelligence services and uh, other related entities like the Internet Research Agency from continuing uh, this sort of interference in the future because his buddy Trump has told him not only even behind closed doors, but in public that like, eh, it's not such a big deal. Don't worry about it. It's a scary thing. I'm just going to add one thing. I'm not a Russia expert. Nina, I'd love to hear if you think I'm wrong on this because this is just a theory. Um, I would also be careful to overly assume that Putin's grand plan is Trump versus Biden, as opposed to just completely breaking our democracy. 100%. I suspect Putin's got more of a long game. Does Trump serve as that like perfect little puppet right now? Yes. But don't think that Putin loves Trump either. I assume that even if Trump were to win four years from now, don't think that this game isn't coming again. It's, it's, it's convenient to overly clarify it as, a, as Putin's trying to get Trump elected and Putin hates Biden or hated Clinton, which by the way, we know he hated Clinton, but, but there's a long, I assume there's a longer game here and it's more about breaking our democracy. And so I just want to, I just want to throw in this, like, there's probably a longer game. I don't focus as much on who is Putin trying to get elected. I focus more on like, what is he doing to so distrust in every potential way that we as Americans can even have the faculty to think about our democracy and think about what we should and shouldn't trust. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next, the next question, I'm going to kind of take two and roll them into one, and they're about um, elections here in the U.S. and security. So one is from Gligor Tashkovich, and um, and he wants to know, how do you think the boards of election should train or equip their temporary workers for the 10 day, at least in New York state um, election period? So um, here in New York City, the three categories are poll workers, polling site coordinators and assembly district monitors. And Gligor is an assembly district monitor this year in his eight hour training classes next Friday. And he's willing to bet right now that security will not even be discussed or addressed. And he wants to know your thoughts on that. And then following up on that, we have a question from Odile uh, Buklez Birch. And I apologize if I butchered your name, but, um, uh, and they want to know whether or not we are going to have international poll observers. And so just to you know, broaden that out, you know, what, what would it take to have that? So. Yeah, we actually have uh, poll observers every year, um, every election, folks from the OSCE, uh, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, um, as well as the Organization for American uh, States and a couple of other international organizations do send observers here. Um, 2020 is no different, uh, perhaps a little different because of coronavirus restrictions. But um, what's interesting is that not all states allow international poll observers. Um, it's, it varies on a state by state basis, so they don't get the same sort of holistic overview that they might uh, in other countries where there isn't this federal election system. Um, I do not know enough about New York State in particular to answer the first question, but one thing that I highlighted in my piece for The Atlantic is that uh, poll workers, especially precinct captains, need to be aware um, of what their uh, their duties and rights are as poll workers in getting people who are interfering, interfering with the process out. They should know who to call in law enforcement and law enforcement should also be briefed on the fact that their job is to protect people's right to vote no matter who they are voting for. Yeah, I'll just point out on the, I mean, Gligor, I, I've also signed up to be a poll worker and I haven't been through the training yet. Um, it's amazing the amount of crazy things I'm signing up to do for this election, but uh, so I can't answer that until after the training happens, but to Nina's point, I mean, this one is complicated because poll workers are volunteers, they're people like me, they're people in the community, and what's really terrifying, again, to go back to what Trump is specific, when Trump says the proud boy should stand by, and then Trump and his son start telling supporters to go defend the polls, those in my mind are complete, not just, they're not even dog whistles. They're out, 
right blatant calls to intimidate voters. And the question is, is it a poll worker's job to put themselves in a place of danger to possibly confront one of these people? No, it shouldn't be. And, and I, so I don't know the answer to your question, but I certainly hope to Nina's point that the people who are being trained, the city officials, the county officials, the state officials are working in lockstep with law enforcement because it cannot be a poll worker's responsibility to have to figure out what to do if somebody shows up with a weapon and intimidates voters in line. They should know that they have an immediate call to a law enforcement officer who is right in the vicinity I just hope that there is really strong coordination with law enforcement this year. Great, thank you. I think we probably have time for about one more question. So um, I have one from Paul Rogers who, um, who writes, Twitter just announced that they will be changing the retweet function to try to slow disinformation. Is this very useful and is Twitter outperforming Facebook in this area? I'll just say, I, I haven't really dug in as much on this new policy yet, but 100%, as I said earlier on, I, Twitter is not perfect and they still have a very similar business model and there are still many things wrong there. But I do think they're being more thoughtful about trying to figure out what some of the right solutions might be. I, I, I'm not trying to like push my own talk on everybody, but the, I just recently released a TED talk which talks about frictionless virality and why it's dangerous and what it means and unpacks that a bit. But anything that puts what, when I say friction for those who aren't you know, as much involved in the technology side, it's, I'll, do you remember, I, I think we called it Nipplegate back on the Super Bowl, whatever year, you know, Janet Jackson showed a little too much. And what happened after that? There became a delay. There was a delay implemented and that delay was just a few seconds, but it was so that TV could catch something like that before it comes out. There's no delay in social media. It is frictionless. It is, that's their whole point. Everybody has a megaphone. Everybody is somehow equally has the right to not just post something, but if the right person decides to retweet it, have it blasted to 2 billion people, that's not freedom of speech. That is being amplified. I mean, I used to work with like Isa Raskin and Renee Dresser are the ones who said freedom of speech doesn't equal freedom of reach. So I, I like the idea. I have to dig in close, more closely on what Twitter's trying to do, but anything that puts a little more friction in the process is a potential way to start reclaiming a little bit of sanity in what we're seeing online. I, I just, I wanna jump in because I did have one last question and I know we're, we, have, we have a hard stop, but um, uh, there's one that I missed that, that I think is good too and might end on a, on a more hopefully upbeat note or at least you know, give, give us tools to think about things. And this is from um, Lori Cooper. Um, and she says, thank you for this discussion. Um, she wants to know whether there are any social listening tools that can help us reclaim our ability to discern fact from fake and at least to refrain from circulating. Um, so I'll, yeah. I'll give a very quick thing to that and then, and then let Nina add in. So again, this is actually the, a big core of my talk. Um, this is going to sound like something that, I mean, this is just for your own individual sanity. Anything you see that you immediately have an emotional reaction to, you should stop. You should pause. Because if you have an emotional reaction to it, you have to think, Am I having it? Was this intentionally meant to provoke an emotional reaction? Because without giving the whole attention economy speech right now, that is exactly how these platforms monetize. It's by getting that emotional reaction and keeping you sucked in and engaged. So if like, let's be real, if it's like, could you imagine if like, might this happen? Oh my God, click here versus like some wonky fact-based title, people are gonna click on that one. As soon as you have an, all I can say, you ask for social listening skills. If you have an emotional, visceral reaction to something, stop, pause, do not share, do not comment, and then come back to it. And then you can do the deep dive of figuring what's the source, where did it come from, should I trust this? But always question if you have an emotional reaction. To that. And some of it will be strong. If you see something that just turns your stomach and you know in your core, this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening in our world, stop and question it for a second because it might have been intentionally sent to you to make you have that reaction. I totally agree. And I'll just add, as we've been sitting here, apparently Twitter has just announced new limits on US politicians and ordinary users 
uh, before the November 3rd election. So that's just been reported in the post and it looks like another good move from my very cursory read so far. Thanks for having us. <laughs> no, thank you both so much for joining and thank you all of you who joined in to listen um, and ask questions. So I really appreciate it. Our next talk is coming up on the 29th, I think it is. Um, and um, I, I think I lost our Zoom. Oh, there, yes, there it is. Uh, with Michelle Bachelet, the High Commissioner for Human Rights for the UN. So that's at 9 a.m. on October 29th. So I do hope you can join. Um, and of course, we're trying to keep these briefings free and open to all. So if you have it in your heart and pockets to donate, we would really appreciate it because creating these conversations and being able to have people attend from around the world, I think is really important. So, um, so thank you both, uh, Nina, Yael, um, and maybe we'll have you back after the election and we can see what happened. So um, thanks everyone. We appreciate it. Bye-bye. <laughs>